Joyce and family, and to all the friends gathered here, we begin our service in Stuart's memory to pay tribute to his life and to honor him. I'm Rabbi Eddie Sukal from the shul. In grief, we turn to the Psalms, these beautiful ancient poems, with the hope that they might give us some measure of consolation, some comfort. So I'd like to chant the 23rd Psalm to begin, and then we'll read it in English. Some of you may know it, and you're certainly welcome to join in. Adonai roi loho echsar, binote she yarbiseni, ame menucho gina haleni, nafshi yishovev, yan geni vamagale tzedek lema anshimo, gam ki elech begets al mavet, lo irara ki ata imadi, shif techa umishan techa, Hema yenach amuni, ta'aroch lefanai shulchan neget sorerai, dishan tava shemen roshi, kos i rivaya, ach tova vachesed yedefuni, kol yemei chayai veshafti, veshafti bevet adonai, leorech yamin. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He guideth me in straight paths for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To all of you, Stuart's large and loving family, we who gather with you today know that you grieve in a darkened world. We understand that in your silence there is sadness in your tears, loneliness. We gather with you to embrace you, to comfort you, to envelop you with our love. And we gather not only that we might comfort you, but to call upon God on your behalf and ask that you feel God's loving presence and that this too be a comfort to you. These first few days after Stuart's death, they are known as Yemei Bechi, the days of wailing and weeping. And it's because we're called upon to let it out, to cry, to grieve, to wail, and to do it fully and deeply. There are so many challenges in grief. But one of them that we confront right away is that along with our deep grieving and our intense sadness, we also reach deep inside of ourselves, each one of us, to find the ability to be grateful for the gift of his life, for a life that was so fully and so well lived. A life that was filled with laughter and smiles, with triumphs of so many different kinds, whether it was in sales or on the ball field, coaching, whatever it was, he lived his life. And thank God for that. And all of you got to be part of that life and to share in the richness of the days and years granted to him. And so we grieve and we grieve fully. And we are also filled with gratitude for the companionship that you shared with him along life's path, 
for the gifts of his heart and mind and those things that he did and said that brought joy and happiness into your lives. For everything about him that is now a precious remembrance. We miss him and we are grateful. From the biblical book, Kohelet, Ecclesiastes. Ancient words of wisdom. For everything there is a season, a time for every experience. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to discard. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. I'd like to invite Joyce and her grandchildren to come forward. My husband will be sadly missed, but happily remembered. Judging by your overwhelming outpouring of sympathy, I am not alone. The common thread is smiles and humor. He would love being defined with these words. In our almost 49 years of marriage, We considered ourselves to be extremely rich because our happiness needed nothing more than love, friends, and family. Every day we shared how blessed we felt with our wonderful children, but in these past months, they all went above and beyond. Without their support, we would never have survived the challenges. As his body failed him, More and more every day, somehow my Stewie managed to function with grace and smiles. Breathing was just about the only thing he could do without my help. Even in these final weeks, with caregivers, he gave a twinkle and humor to the room. When our precious grandchildren remember Papa, They'll have to smile and recall endearing nicknames which I wouldn't even attempt to share because I couldn't say them right. In spite of it all, he always pushed to get to as many plays, concerts, recitals, and sporting events as possible. We grandparents are love, traditions, and cheerleaders on the sidelines. Papa will always be there next to you guys. We are all better for having known and loved optimistic Stuart. When you think of him, please smile. And with your smile, he will live forever. Thanks for being here and being so supportive, everyone. Thank you. like to call upon Jamie to share some words. Thank you all so much for the abundance of love and support. We know many of you are grieving as well because my dad touched so many lives in so many ways and 
had really beautiful friendships. As you know, Stu was fun, engaging, schmoozy, entertaining, so lovable, and genuinely interested in connecting with others. He got to know people in a short period of time, and I mean really got to know them, uh, before the kids' sporting events or a musical, whoever's sitting next to him, before it even starts, they're laughing and talking. He could tell you the life story of the last repairman in their house or a waiter he had a few weeks ago because he's just so sociable and makes everybody feel comfortable. That's my dad. As charming and sociable as he was, he was also really content at home in his own world and his world with mom. He enjoyed doing the plain dealer crossword puzzles, reading mystery novels, watching old movies, or studying football stats and picks for hours and hours. This relaxed time was often preceded by a volunteer shift at one of the three hospitals he volunteered at. Um, so probably for the last 15, 20 years, uh, starting with Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in the pediatric cancer ward, he would um, sit with the kids during their treatments and get to know them and their families, so much so that he found himself at some funerals because he was so in touch with these families. Um, then he moved on to volunteer at outpatient surgery at Hillcrest and Ahuja, only stopping because of COVID. He loved working at the hospitals. Afternoons for dad almost always included a three mile walk where he would walk through the metro parks um, waving at people and them knowing him. I remember even growing up, he, well, he would run on the track at Beechwood High School, but everyone across the neighborhood knew him because he walked every day. Um, and then even as he started to struggle with walking, he kept doing it and we'd say, dad, please just stay in your little neighborhood. No, 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 I'm good. He would be hunched over. He would be stopping multiple times to stretch. People pull over, ask him if he needs a ride. I'll say, nope, I'm good, just stretching. He, and then they'd wonder, who's the crazy guy in the 90 degree weather bundled up in a sweatshirt and towel around his neck because he needed the good sweat? Oh no, I love it, he said. He also quite enjoyed grocery shopping in his retired years, taking great pleasure in preparing his and mom's nightly salads to accompany whatever main course she had in mind. They had decades as empty nesters, so very compatible with their nightly routine together, enjoying each other's company after their respective days. Dinner, nightly news on TV, recorded shows, card games, Netflix. I can't tell you the number of times I called them on FaceTime and just said, you guys are so cute. I mean, they just, the two of them with their cheerful sing-song interactions, it's honestly what we dream of for our parents and for ourselves too, but that we would be lucky enough that they could grow old together, enjoying the golden years with your best friend. Um, so lots of people know I talk to my mom pretty much every day, just a quick check-in and dad gets on the phone, hi, Akoya, hi, Quizzy, how you doing? That's my nickname from childhood, which by the way, growing up, he said it all the time. And then when I was living with them before I got married as a young adult, he kept saying it. I'd come see him in the morning. Hi. Then I see him later. Hi. At, hi, Akoya. Hi, Quizzy. And I'm like, dad, we're in the same house. You don't have to keep saying hi. Uh, so he just, he, he's always, oh, hi, Akoya. So anyway, I, um, when I moved away in 2002 after getting married, I started to really crave the Hayakoya, and when I, you know, just calling on the phone, it, it, it was home to hear him say that and coming in then, I would never once stop him from saying it. Because anyway, back to talking to my mom on the phone, I also called my dad a couple times a week because I needed my special dad talks because he was such a good sounding board and he's so objective and direct, like a perfect compliment to mom and I talking emotionally about things. And he would ask about everything, about everyone. I had to save a lot of time for these calls because how's, how's Eric? Tell me how Barnes Alita is doing. And he's had a nickname for everybody. Nobody was called by their original name. I got my son Cameron, the great Cameroonsk, and Logan, Logadoga. Bailey Bales even came up with Alzin for our dog, Ollie. Uh, but he wanted to talk and talk. Honestly, two weeks ago today, we had a long talk. And it was 
he was so with it. I kept saying to my brother and my mom calling from Virginia, dad seems fine. I don't, I mean, I know he's having trouble walking, but he, he's, he's asking me things I don't even recall. He know, he's so with it. Well, the next day I got the sense things were really just changing quickly. So I came home Wednesday um, and just, I, it's just astounding how quickly it changed because his mind stayed with it while his body was changing, you know. I'm so grateful that our kids each built their own unique relationship with my parents um, because they get to take that with them. Some out-of-town grandparents might see their grandkids once or twice a year, but we've all made a concerted effort over the last 16 years to go back and forth every month or two. You know, you come here, we'll go there. Um, And I love that Eric, my husband, has had the pleasure of loving and enjoying both mom and dad for over 25 years. My dad is literally a part of me from, I have his hands, his small hands and stubby nails, both of us with our borderline OCD, which basically for us translates to doing similar, same things each day that make us feel good. We crave routine. And I learned that, I mean, I just am so much like him. Our shared love of exercising for a great sweat, our homebody nature with such contentment, being introverted for regular periods of time to recharge, you know, if you like oatmeal, why not have it every day? Then he would have his turkey sandwich every day, but eventually, maybe after a couple of months, get tired of it and switch to chicken noodle soup, but then it was every day. So if they came to visit, I got the chicken noodle soup so he could keep up with his. So that's what I mean by OCD, but we always said if it, if it works and it makes you feel good, do it, but I, I have a lot of that with me. Anyway, uh, when I came in the last time a couple of weeks ago, um, I... Or, Oh, just over a week ago, I wanted to make sure to feed him some of his favorites because we're both obsessed with enjoying food, and we know he's like, oh, you have to taste this. You have to taste this. Um, so I do that to my husband. He doesn't get quite as excited as Stu with having to taste something. But when I came in town, I got him his ham and black olive pizza from Pizzazz, his burger and fries, winking lizard popcorn, and the family favorite homemade mandel bread. And it was so sweet to watch him savor every bite. After the piece of mon- the first piece of mandel bread, he was just his. He wasn't talking that much, but his eyes were closed in just delight. And I said, "Do you want another piece?" He kind of turned his head and gave me the look, like, "Can we sneak it in?" So we did. And um, after all, why not? A couple of days later, he stopped eating. So that's when reality really set in that his 88 years of enjoying life were coming to a close. He toughed it out for numerous back surgeries, prostate cancer, a hip replacement, neuropathy, neuralgia, whatever, never letting these challenges get get him down. He fought hard, he loved deeply, and left his unique stew mark everywhere, brightening the days of all of those he encountered. I'm gonna miss my dad in a huge way. My heart aches knowing that I can't pick up the phone and hear Hayakoya or Kuzi with his love coming through the receiver. If you've had the pleasure of knowing him, you've known one of the most special people you'll ever know. A couple of hours before he died, this past Friday morning, I was home in Virginia thinking about driving in that day. Um, And I knew then it was becoming clear after sitting on the FaceTime the night before watching him that it wouldn't work, like it was going to be too late. So I was going to FaceTime with mom while she sat by his bedside. And... I I just wanted to get in a 20-minute workout on the Peloton because I knew he would understand that I would do it for both of us. And I was sweating and crying and feeling his energy so strongly in this Ben Aldis 80s ride, if any Peloton lovers out there. But this um, Tina Turner song came on at the most perfect time with my outburst of emotion alone in our basement. Her words got him just right. I don't know the rest of the words of the song, but you're simply the best, better than all the rest, better than anyone, anyone I ever met. Dad, you're simply the best. I will think of you daily when I exercise, when I savor food, when I'm chatting up a stranger, and mostly when I'm brightening someone else's day. Because between you and our sunshine mom over there, 
Darren and I learn from the very best. Thank you for being exactly you. I will carry you in my heart every day of my life. I love you, and I'm eternally proud and grateful to be your Koya. Jamie, thank you. To share some remembrances, Cameron and Julia. Should I keep it? All right. If, if you don't know me, my name's Cameron Schaefer, the lucky grandson of Stuart, or as my brother Logan, sister Bailey, and my four cousins, Julia, Kate, Jake, and Lucia, all knew him as Papa. The 16 years of my life, I've shared countless memories with my papa, from sitting on his lap playing Sesame Street games on the computer when I was younger, to talking about football games on FaceTime a few times a week. I loved all of our time together. A few, weeks, er, a few years ago, my papa and I started a tradition with my parents, siblings, and of course, Grammy. Each week, Sunday morning, I would call him and we would pick all the NFL football games. We would have a winner each week, and at the end of every year, there would be one winner. I will continue that tradition with my family, even though he can no longer participate. <sighs> one funny story I have, or that I have that I love in particular takes place at a restaurant where my family lives back in Virginia. Years ago, my brother Logan didn't want to eat anymore, but had a lot more food left. Papa said to him, you just put it all on your fork and shove it all in. <laughs> We've joked about that since we have joked about that ever since that day. Even when we visited him this past weekend, we mentioned it, and while my mom was feeding Papa his burger and fries, he laughed and said in his funny voice, You just put it all on your fork and shove it all in. Another thing my papa was known for was his nicknames. He came up with the most random nicknames for people and they always stuck. My most famous nickname started about five to six years ago when for a couple of months I randomly started doing card tricks. I, lo <laughs> I love to do my card tricks for him and he, <laughs> and my magician name he called me was the Great Kamerunsk. <laughs> He's called me that ever since. We had another inside thing that when we would see each other we would ask each other if we've seen any snacks, which is the most random possible thing anyone can think of. I, along with Papa, have no clue what that possibly could mean. <laughs> we just said it because it was our thing. Thank you for always supporting me along with my siblings and cousins in our activities. You and Grammy would always come visit to watch baseball games, basketball games, football games, musicals, and the list goes on. Papa, Wherever you are right now, I miss you, buddy. I miss your humor and jokes. I feel empty with it. I feel empty without you, even though I know you'll always be with me. Thank you for talking to me every week and most of all just being you. Find some snacks in heaven for me. <laughs> See you one day. I love you so much. The great Cameroons. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of my brother, Jake, and my sister, Kate. <laughs> Papa Stu had a huge impact on every single person he met. Whether you knew him your whole life or he happened to be at the table you were serving that night. Everyone who knows us knows our Papa. He was at every single play, concert, and, sp and sporting event. Oh, sorry, I can't read it. <laughs> um, 
even when we sat on the bench, or that year's play was not his favorite. Papa made us laugh every time we saw him. Even sending him a happy birthday text meant he would come up with a response that was sure to make you smile. For example, instead of saying thank you, he would send back a cat or unicorn emoji. (laughs) Papa even made us smile on his worst days. Through some of the hardest times, he found a way to look over at us and stick his tongue out or make a face just to get us laughing. When I was a baby, my mom would drop me off at Grammy and Papa's every Monday while she went to work, and I would cry from the minute she dropped me off to the minute she picked me up. That is, until Papa would put me on his shoulder, which always seemed to calm me down immediately. As we cry and mourn him, I picture him holding us all on his shoulder, telling us to calm down and that everything will be okay. We love you forever, Papa Stu. Love the rosebuds. Thank you. I want to share a short paragraph from Scott. Stu was my dad for 64 years. Looking back, I recognize and appreciate his role in my becoming a generally upstanding citizen. Stu was 23 when I was born. He was a dedicated young father to a fault. One day while while playing catch in front of our house, he continued the fun even after I managed to throw the ball through two of our windows, including our picture window. On another occasion, after returning home from Shaker Day Camp, he immediately schlepped me back to camp so that we could confront some poor camp counselor after I told my dad that I had been bitten by a horse. The truth more likely was that he nibbled my arm. Another time, after injuring my thumb in a baseball game, we went to Hillcrest Hospital, where the doctor mistakenly thought that I had injured my wrist. Stu corrected his diagnosis, informing him that I hadn't injured my thumb. He concluded that the doctor was incompetent and dragged me out of Hillcrest to Richmond Osteopathic Hospital, where we found a doctor who knew what he was doing and determined that I had a broken thumb. I'll miss recounting these stories and others with my dad, but I'll always remember remember them as as special to both of us. Stu was a good man, he was earnest, his legacy is his family, and I am grateful to have been his son. I'd like to ask Eric to come forward to share with us. First, I was going to read a note from my daughter, Bailey. So if you can imagine me as an 11-year-old girl, this is her, this is her sentiment, sentiment. Dear Papa, I love you so much. You were the best grandpa I could ever ask for. You always knew how to make someone laugh with your great nicknames like Loga Doga, Kamaruski, Olivesin, and Bales. Thank you for being willing to come to my shows come to many shows that I've been in, uh, plus Cam and Logan sporting games. I will miss and will never and will never stop missing you. You always put a smile on my face with your funny jokes and amazing personality. Life is short and you made the best of it. I will be forever grateful for you and I love you to the moon and back. Love, Bales. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Eric Schaefer. I'm Jamie's husband, uh, Cameron, Logan, and Bailey's dad. Uh, but to Stu, I was always known as E. Rich Barnes. You guys have heard that Stu kind of gave everybody a nickname, um, and I was no exception. Uh, the only thing about my nickname was everybody else kind of had some nice, cute nickname. 
E. Rich Barnes was a real person. Um, e. Rich Barnes was a six foot three, 215 pound cornerback who played for the Cleveland Browns in the 1960s. To give his future son-in-law a barely five foot ten Jewish lawyer the same name as this great Browns player was, was beyond me. I, I often wondered what was going on in Stu's beautiful mind when he came up with these things. But for Stu it just fit. And given these names really showed everybody how important they were to, were to him in his life. So I took it um, with pride and I enjoyed it. For short, he'd call me Barnes or Barnsey. Um, Stu, through all my, uh, throughout our life together with, with me and Jamie, um, he, he embraced that name. So any, any birthday cards, every year on my birthday, he called and sang, Happy Birthday, Dear Barnsey. He, he wrote it on every Father's Day card, every time I, I talked to him. Um, when I was working in the NFL for the Redskins, I, I would travel often um, on Sundays and game days, and Jamie would and the kids would talk to him every Sunday, so even when I wasn't there. Um, and many times he didn't want to bother me, so he would give Jamie messages for me. Uh, he would say things like, um, Jamie, you got to tell Barnsey the, uh, the, the uh, Eagles are only two-and-a-half-point favorite, and it's December. Skin's got it in the bag. Don't worry. Um, the other thing about Stu is I, as I got to know him, Inevitably, when he would come to visit or we would come here, he, um, I, got, I got to spend a lot of quality time with him. So Jamie and Joyce would, would go, go out together, go shopping to spend time together. It was often just Stu and I, typically in front of the TV watching a game or, or watching golf. Um, we, we definitely talked a lot about sports, but we talked, we talked a lot about life. Uh, we talked about business. We talked about politics. Um, it was really, we talked about movies. It was really an amazing experience, and, and Stu became a great mentor to me. Uh, he, as, as we grew up, um, you know, I moved his, his daughter, who had grown up here, when you know she was very young, and he always gave me these conversations. He just said, um, "You, you got to follow your dreams. Wherever you guys go, we'll be there. So don't worry. Don't worry about Joyce. I'll get her to go, and and we'll be there." Um, we also, you know, we he he would tell me about. I I learned a lot about him. I learned about when he was in the army, and he was a medic. Um, I learned about when he was a high school football player for um, Shaker football. I learned about what life was like being a single man for Stu. Um, sometimes he shared and sometimes he overshared, which you might want to hear uh, from your father-in-law, but always, always interesting, always, always fun nonetheless. Um, you know, as Jamie talked about, he... In order to keep his mind sharp, I mean, he studied the lines of, of the football picks. It wasn't just football. I mean, he'd study it every day. He had, his, he had his little pencil, his eraser. He'd study football lines. He'd study baseball games. He'd study basketball. Any sport that you could imagine that could have had a betting line, that was Stu. Uh, he was always studying it. And he always, you know, he was always just wasn't sure. And so he, he always just thought there was something going on. He, he would say to me, um, you know, th this team's favored by three and a half, and their defensive ends out. I don't know. Something's going on. What do you think? It's something. There, there's something happening here. And so he, after he did this for a number of years, I'd say, Stu, what, do you think they're cheating? Do you, what, what do you think's happening here? Um, he said, I don't know. You, you know. you know these football players. And I said, you think they're taking money? And he just, he just shook his head and said, I don't know. But it, it was... That was kind of one of our debates. He, he, he took it so seriously and so, uh, and so personally. Um, but through our conversations, 
every step of the way in, in our life, in our career, um, having a family, as our family grew, he was always there to support me um, wh wherever I went. We lived in Kansas City. He came there to see us. Um, then we moved to, to Virginia, where we live now, and, and, and they were always there. He, um, I initially started my career in, in motorsports, and just every time I talked to him, he, whether he was interested or not, he acted incredibly interested and, and had so many things to, to ask me and uh, would corner me and just want to know everything going on. Um, when, we, when I moved to the NFL, Stu, uh, being a football fan, was, was particularly excited, um, and I was excited for him. Um, I could remember kind of one of, the, one of the first times I had him. Now, Stu was just happy. He was thrilled to just sit on his couch and, and watch all the games, um, you know, in his, in his chair. He, he certainly didn't need to go to any games. But when they came to visit, it was, it was the first time, and, and we told him we were taking him to the game. Um, Stu, in, in many ways, is like a little kid with his excitement. He was just beaming, smiling ear to ear. Um, and Jamie and I and Joyce had talked about, well, who's going to watch Stu? We're going to take him on the field, and, and who knows if he's going to go talk to the referee, if he's going to go talk to the owners of the other team. we got to watch him. Um, so we, I remember us coming, coming through the tunnel, and, and Jamie's looking back and making sure that, that she's got Stu, and she was going to be in charge of him just in case so he didn't, he didn't get out and, and go anywhere. And he said he just kept saying, "JB, I'm gonna be fine. I'm gonna be fine. Just I'll be, I'll be cool. I'll be cool." Um, so I took Stu. Uh, I took him around, introduced him to some some of my colleagues, some people that that I worked with, um, even some coaches, including the head coach. And and Stu was good. He said, "See, look, I could I could handle this. This is I, I'm acting like I've been here before. What are you guys all worried about?" Um, and, and then I just I decided I, I saw a running back coach and I thought I'm going to go introduce him to Stu. Um, our running back coach was um, was Ernest Biner at the time, and, and Ernest, for all the Cleveland Browns fans, was you know kind of a controversial figure in, in one way or another, um, involved in the fumble. And I knew Stu as a good as a good Browns fan uh, would would know him and and remember him at least appreciate meeting him. Um, but I figured Stu was just going to stay cool. So I bring him over. I bring him over, and it's really loud. I think the band's playing. And I just I said, hey, Stu, I just want to introduce you to this coach. Um, he puts his hand out, and and he shakes his hand. And, he's, and Stu says, well, what's your name? I, I couldn't. It was, it was loud. He couldn't hear. And he says, I'm Ernest Biner. So Stu said, oh, my God. <laughs> and he hugged him and just wouldn't let go until his headset fell off. And so Jamie and I just walked. We walked him off. Stu was beaming. He was beaming ear to ear. Um, and we just shook our head and just, that's just, that's just Stu being Stu. The, there's nothing you could do except just smile and, and be happy. Um, he was always such a huge part of our kids' lives, as they mentioned. Um, he would come... When he would visit, he would come to their games. Um, he would come to their theater performances. Um, I even remember, which is unbelievable to me, that our kids, their middle school band performances, um, where my son's playing the baritone, Stu is on FaceTime just so he could hear it. Well, as you might guess, we were there in person, and I hope my kids aren't listening, but it wasn't that great. <laughs> Somehow, Stu and Joyce <laughs> sat through uh, those performances on FaceTime. And then, you know, when I talked to him after, I heard the Stu talking to the kids. And, of course, um, his references are from Cleveland. He says, you guys should be in the Cleveland Orchestra. That was unbelievable. <laughs> and it was not. <laughs> um, Stu on the, on the ball field was, was particularly uh, excitable. We, um, I remember a game of, of Cameron's that I took him to, and there were, um, the umpire didn't think, he didn't think it was great. His team was losing, um, 
He was calling guys out on strikes. Stu, Stu wasn't happen, uh, happy with, uh, with what was going on. So he screamed. I mean, he just, you can't not hear him. He's saying, that is bullshit. <laughs> and uh, the umpire's standing right there. And I said, hey, Stu, you just, you just got to calm down. He's like, that is bullshit. They should never have hired this umpire. They're taking everything away from these kids. Um, and I said, just, just to give you some context, Cameron was eight years old. <laughs> And, and the umpire was 12. Um, but that was Stu. He, he led with his heart. Um, everything, everything he did was, was with his heart. And he, he may not have always said it exactly the right way or done it exactly the right way, but that was... Um, that, that was who he was. And, and I'll just, I'll close. I had one other story just that I, I found out um, when we came into town. We, um, Joyce was telling me a story of, of a neighbor. And it, it wasn't even really a neighbor. So Stu went on, on these long walks through the metro parks. And he, you know, he took these, these I guess, three-mile walks. And it, it, he... Um, they received a card, and it was it was from this woman who they, he would one of the people that he met on just on his walks. Now this wasn't one of his neighbors. This this wasn't um, this wasn't a friend of, of Darren and Danielle's. This wasn't the, there was um, to you know sometimes people in business and and, and are, are jaded and just think well what, what would that person have to have to offer. Uh, Stu. So wh why would he, he stop? I mean, this was, I don't know, a mile and a half into his walk. Um, and we passed our house today, and it was a family as, in, a, in a small house. They, uh, they had four children. Um, and, and I just wanted to read something from this woman who wrote the letter and just talked about Stu's smile and, and how they, he, he impacted them. Um, he, she said that I just let you know your smiling face and positive attitude was missed. I must mention the fact that you always impress me by remembering and rattling off all of the familial names. So th this was a, a young woman who had a bunch of kids. Um, she said everything you did, uh, everything, all of your recall from memory was amazing. I always passed along to the family. Um, she said it's funny how people come to meet. With your daily walk, I still see you walk. Uh, I still see you walk passing by, and it, if it had not been for your outgoing personality, that's where it may have ended. Um, and I, I think I know for you know for me and, and for 99 percent of us that that's how it would end. You, you'd take a walk, you'd walk by somebody, you may see them and give them a wave or a smile. But uh, Stu had to engage these people. Um, he engaged them and he created a, a friendship where they, they came to really appreciate and look forward to, to his walks. Um, and she said, thanks, Stu, for taking the time to stop and chat and show simple interest in a young and growing family. Your friendship uh, has always been very special. Um, Anyway, I just uh, when I when I got home and heard that, I just thought I just thought that was Stu. That, that really to me showed uh, the guy I know, and um, I'll, I'll miss him greatly. I love you, Stu. Thank you. to share memories of his father, Darren. Sorry. It's usually easier to stand and talk than this. The good news is these long-winded folks before me took about 80% of what I was going to say, so. Uh, it's been a rough, it's been a rough last few weeks for my family, for my dad mostly. And we watched my wedding video recently in which he, uh, 
he gave a long speech. That's where we all get it from. And we fast forward it numerous times. And then it was finally over. And then I spoke. We fast forward that for about two and a half hours. And I never understand at this day how my wife didn't, my brand new wife didn't get a hook and just yanked me off the stage. But in the spirit of long-winded Stu or me, we'll try to keep it short, but this will be the last hurrah. So you heard about my dad's volunteering, unbelievable sitting with families while they were literally in the pits of hell having their kids taking chemo. Uh, adults, just being an amazing person. Uh, what we didn't mention is I remember being a little kid. Uh, my parents had written a beautiful letter to Santa Claus that asked them to please make an exception and let us find Jewish people, get some gifts on Christmas. <laughs> so my sister and I were the beneficiaries of not only eight nights of Hanukkah, but Christmas Day. But my dad always took off right after we opened the presents, and he wouldn't return until uh, pretty close to dinner when my grandparents would come over because he was at a, a hospital in any department they needed him, trying to make sure that somebody who did celebrate Christmas got to be home with their family that day and take, take their hours for him. Um, he was never there for the times when my mom had to explain something very, you may not know this about Santa Claus, uh, a defective toy or a toy that was out of favor with my sister and I. Apparently Santa at the time had deals with Children's Palace, Kitty City, and Toys R Us that you could exchange or take back these said toys. It's no wonder none of them are in business anymore. <laughs> the Santa effect ruined the toy industry. All the Jews were returning their gifts. By the way, I wanted to mention my brother um, was in Chicago last night flying up from Austin with his wife and their plane got canceled. And they are on, en route to Cleveland now in a rental car and hopefully he'll meet us at the cemetery. But uh, that's why the rabbi was kind enough to uh, speak Scott's words. Um, I'll just tell you a couple quick stories that I just feel embody. You, you know, he's a smiley guy. He's a happy guy. Uh, there's just some good memories. I, I played uh, baseball for all my school years and, and summer years with Damian Creel, who is black, his dad is black, and my dad and Marv Creel um, hopefully have reconnected. Rest in peace, Marv, also. Uh, they had a special bond, and it was somewhat, you know, if you were a black person who didn't know their bond, you might have found it inappropriate uh, the way <laughs> my dad spoke to him. Like, I don't know. Uh, one, one night at a varsity basketball game, my dad, we, I was near my parents sitting there, and Marv Creel entered the gym. And there had to be a moment in the game, I don't know what happened, but it, it, it literally made this gym go silent. I don't know why. But you could have heard a pin drop prior to my dad yelling, What's up, bro? <laughs> and the entire place just turned to say, What is that white guy doing? Mark Creel yelled, What's up, Stu? And they, ha they hugged, and everything was good. Just thinking about some of these memories. We were watching Friday Night Lights the other night. As, uh, as we try to steal some sleep and uh, some of the final hours to show that many of you may know, I think the greatest show ever made, and I beat my dad into submission to make him agree. So he too would say it was the greatest show ever made. Um, but sporting events, obviously, you, I don't want to repeat everything. You know, th these are what made, make my parents happy. That they're always there. I've received so many texts over the last few days from people who I've even haven't been in touch with in 20 years just to say, I remember your dad coaching. I remember him smiling. I remember him cracking jokes. And his jokes are, are what I, I have. I've been in line with him at an amusement park or at a grocery store or at a bank where literally the stranger standing next to him by the time they're at the front of the line is his friend. And, you know, something that I, I truly hope I'm able to always do. I, I give a lot of people nicknames. You know, a lot of you would might have one. Um, he, he, he's just a guy you could always count on, even my friends growing up, a, a friend that I'll, I'll leave nameless for right now, left his flask in a car one night. My dad went to fill the car up the next day and found Seth's flask, and uh, he never told, he never told, he never sold them out. I just want to make sure I don't forget uh, if there was another story I'm forgetting. Oh, I mean, just t two great lessons that he gave me. The first thing my dad, I think, ever taught me was to shake hands. 
when you meet somebody or greet somebody, firm handshake, look them in the eye. And, and I always have tried to live by that. And at the similar time, my dad took German through many of his years in school. And his grandmother was German. He taught me to say, go shit in the ocean in German. So uh, I can't tell you what it is right now as I stand there. I got to Google Translate it later, but something with Yaffen in it. But it was uh, just the memories and the, and the lessons we take. And the, the final thing to the NFL picks, my dad enjoyed, you know, picking out the games, and he and I would bet on a few every week. But he also, um, as much as the games were fixed in his mind, the next time you watch a game and the next time a NFL player, offensive lineman, makes a false start, every single false start I've ever witnessed with my dad, and that's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,290 false starts, he would always turn to me and say to me, as if it was the first time, can you believe these effing guys can't remember the snap count from the huddle to the line of scrimmage every single time, as if it was the first time? I'm like, not, I, know, I can't believe it, Dad. I can't believe it. I think that's uh, the big thing. I, you know, he, he's the waiter waitress thing is something I've, I've started to grow into myself. Uh, I haven't quite got to that, how'd you enjoy your meal? We hated it. I, I don't get to that yet, but he would always hate it. He'd give her the empty plate. I couldn't even eat it. And those are just typical dad jokes. But at this point, um, I've caught myself. I've embarrassed Jake on some road trips for baseball. My kids have called me out for dad jokes, but my wife has made a routine habit now of calling me Stuart when I make these dad jokes. And usually when I, she says, oh, Stuart, hilarious. Stuart, you're so funny. I'll be like, oh, am I turning into my dad? But now, should she call me Stuart when she will, I will wear it with a badge of honor. Um, my first 47 plus years have been supported by and every day with, you know, know, I'm in touch with my dad all the time. The next 47 could never be the same. But what I ask all of you to do in his memory, which I will do every day, I hope you all can do, just smile at somebody, make their day, because my dad always told me, you don't know what somebody's dealing with. You don't know what's, what's going on. You don't know why they're snapping at you or being unpleasant or why they're just not smiling. So give them a smile, chat them up a little bit, not because you're trying to close a sale, although he and I both were proud, we're usually looking to close a sale. But... <laughs> Don't smile at them because you're trying to do that. Just smile at them because it's the right thing to do to make them happy. And, uh, you know, the world needs more Stuart Roses because it's going to miss the hell out of the original. Darren, thank you. Over the weekend, families received many phone calls and emails and messages of sympathy and condolence and encouragement. I just, they shared with me yesterday a, a, a few of them, and I, I may not have the quotations exactly right, but I just want to share these because they really, they get at the essence of what we've all heard. High school friends of Jamie's who wrote to her and said, your parents were a staple of our childhood. What a wonderful compliment, not just for Stuart, but for Joyce as well. Parents were a staple of our childhood. That's the kind of people they were. And friends of theirs from Virginia who met Stuart maybe four, five, six times, not, not that many times over the years. They wrote that they adored him. And somebody wrote, he's one of my favorite guys. Somebody barely knows him. He's one of my favorite guys. And then somebody else wrote, we lost a legend. You had a loving husband. Yours was a love affair for the ages. You were for each other. What our tradition calls an Ezra Kinegdo. That's the term for a spouse. It's a curious phrase. Ezra means a helper. A supporter, and that sure you were that, but it's the second part that's a little curious. Ezer 
That's the helper part. Kinegdo, who pushes up against someone. See, that's it has to have both aspects of that. Sometimes you have to you support best by by encouraging, but also by maybe pushing a little bit or providing a little resistance. And you were that for one another. You were Ezra Kinegdo. A wonderful love affair, and from it came this beautiful, beautiful family. Stuart, a loving father and grandfather, brother, uncle, a friend to so many, all of you here and, and so many others. Joyce and Jamie and Darren, what I hope for you and your families is that the more recent period that has been so difficult as you alluded to, let those memories fade into the recess of your mind and instead remember Stuart in the fullness of his life with that big smile, the laughter, the unbridled optimism, the can-do, will-do, is-doing kind of way he carried himself in the world. Let that be what you remember. Let those be the stories that you share. To ask of death that it never come is futile. But it is not futility to pray that when death does come for us, it may take us from a world one corner of which is a little better because we were there. The influence, the impact of a person continues to exert itself long after mortal bonds have broken. Not only that he lives on in our hearts or in anything that he truly touched, a person transmits permanently something of what he was to all of us. The fabric of the universe is continuous and eternal. Zecher Tzadik Livracha, Stuart's memory will be forever be a blessing to all of us who knew him and who loved him. Amen. Please rise. El Mole Rachamim Shochein Bamromim Ham Tzem Nucha Nechona Tachat Kanfei Hashchina Im Kedoshim Utehorim Kizohar Harakia Mazirim Ed nishmato shehalach le'olamo Began ed en tehei menuchato Ana bal harachamim Hastirehu beseter kenafecha le'olamim Vayitzror bitro hachayim Ed nishmato Adonai hu nachalato Vianuach Bishalom al Mishkavo Vinomar Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Stuart K. Rose, for he has now entered eternity. O God of mercy, we pray, may Stuart find refuge in your eternal presence. And may his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. And together we say, Amen. Please be seated. We will continue with our burial service at Mount Olive Cemetery. The family will observe Shiva at Danielle and Darren's residence, 33250 North Burr Oak Drive in Solon. Shiva will be today from 5 to 9 p.m. and again tomorrow from 4 until 8 p.m. For those who might wish to honor Stewart's memory with a charitable contribution, his family suggests that you direct your generosity to pediatric cancer at university hospitals. <laughs> 